So we've just finished establishing probably one of the most important things about homomorphisms from a group G to a group H. And that is that the image of that homomorphism will necessarily be a subgroup of the target group H. And most importantly of all, the kernel of that homomorphism, that subset of all elements that are getting sent to the identity element in the target group. The kernel is a normal subgroup of G and therefore is capable of telling us a way in which G can be built out of a normal subgroup. In this video, we want to clean up some more properties of homomorphisms that are inherited from the similar properties about isomorphisms, just by virtue of having the product rule of respecting structure. Is it still true that if two elements commute in G, that their images under a homomorphism will commute in H? The answer to that one is manifestly yes. All we have to do is just apply phi to both sides of this equation, uh, and it remains true. We don't need one to one and on two to make that conclusion. For isomorphisms, we had the statement that if G were a cyclic group generated by A, then H is a cyclic group generated by phi of A, and vice versa. That was true for isomorphisms. But remember, for a homomorphism in general, not all of H is necessarily getting hit by this function. It might not be onto. And so if it's not onto, we can replace H by the image of phi instead. It's a subgroup of H after all. Um, but is it still going to be true that the group G is cyclic, generated by A, if and only if the image of this homomorphism, under this homomorphism, is cyclic and generated by phi of A. Well, only one of those directions is going to remain true. The other direction is going to require one-to-oneness. We're not going to be able to go backwards to say that the image of phi is cyclic and generated by phi of A implies the original group is generated by A. That's only going to be true if we can go backwards because our function is one-to-one. -one. And So if my homomorphism is not one-to-one, -one, I got to take that part out. And so we can say with certainty that if G is a cyclic group, then the image of G under this homomorphism is going to be a cyclic subgroup of H. So that's the best that we can do here, but it's still something. We also had a property about orders of elements. This one was super valuable when we were thinking about isomorphisms. It said that the order of any element in G agrees exactly with the order of its image in H. That was true for isomorphisms. What about for homomorphisms? Let's suppose that, the, uh, that A is an element of order K where for now let's assume k is finite, but there's a parallel argument we could make if k were infinite. This means that a to the kth power is equal to the identity, and also it means that no smaller power of a is equal to the identity other than a to the zero. But if a to the k is equal to the identity, I can apply my homomorphism phi to both sides, and using only the homomorphism property that sends powers to powers and identity to identity, I can conclude that phi of a raised to the power k is also equal to the identity. Does this show me that phi of a has order k? Well, not exactly. Because it might be the case the smaller power of phi of a becomes the identity before we get to the kth power. And so the best that we can say is that the order of phi of a is less than or equal to the order of a. If we don't have the one-to-oneness uh, that let me make the conclusion going both directions when we had an isomorphism. In fact, we can strengthen this up a little bit. It needs to not only be true that the order of phi of a is less than or equal to the order of a, but it also, in particular, um, is not going to be equal to unless my function is one to one. And it also cannot just be any random number less than or equal to the order of a. It, in fact, has to be a divisor of the order of a. So we're going to rephrase this to say that the order of the image of an element under a homomorphism is a factor of the order of the original element. All right, one or two more properties we want to look at. And these are properties that operate not at the level of elements, but at the level of entire pieces, substructures, subgroups inside of the groups that a homomorphism connects. So how did the relevant comparisons with isomorphisms uh, tell us something about the relevant comparisons for homomorphisms? What can we salvage when we lose bijection at the level of entire pieces of groups? Well, when phi was an isomorphism, there existed an inverse isomorphism that just goes the other way. Well, this one we can't hope for. After all, if phi is not a bijective function, 
it's not even going to have an inverse function to begin with. So the only homomorphisms that have inverses are, in fact, isomorphisms themselves. And that's an if and only if criterion. The only way to have an invertible homomorphism is to have an isomorphism, and vice versa. But all is not completely lost. We had this comparison with, uh, uh, with isomorphisms, that if I have an isomorphism between two groups, then one of those groups is abelian, if and only if the other one is abelian. And this comparison, well, first of all, requires us to restrict from h down to the image of phi, because after all, a homomorphism which is not onto is not going to tell me anything about that piece of h that's not being hit by this homomorphism. Probably not going to tell me much about it. So if I restrict to the image of phi, then we had the result from, the, uh, from a few minutes ago that said that elements which commute in G will have images that commute in the image of phi, in H. And so the backwards direction does require one-to-oneness, but the forwards direction requires only the homomorphism property. So the image of an abelian group under a homomorphism will always be an abelian subgroup of my target group. The cyclic criteria we talked about already a few minutes ago as well. If we restrict from h down to the image of phi, we can conclude that the image of a cyclic group is going to be a cyclic subgroup of the target group. All right, let's talk about the bigger sort of subgroup level pieces of this. If I start with a subgroup of the domain G, is the image phi of k going to be a subgroup of h? And the answer to that, fortunately, is yes. Let's take a look at why. So if I start with a subgroup k of my domain, so that's going to include the identity element for sure, and I take all the elements from k and I apply the homomorphism phi to them, that's going to map over here to a, a set that we call phi of k, is that subset of h going to be a subgroup? Let's just apply our favorite one-step subgroup test. If I take two elements of this subset, I call them x and y, is it going to be true that x times the inverse of y is also an element in that subset? And the answer is yes. If x belongs to phi of k, that means x is equal to phi of a for some element a that belonged to k. And if y belongs to phi of k, that means y is equal to phi of b for some b inside of k. If I then take x times y inverse, that's going to be phi of a times the inverse of phi of b. After all, that's how we defined a and b in the first place. They're the elements of k that map respectively to x and to y. But the inverse of phi of b is phi of b inverse, and the product of the images is the image of the product, just using the properties of homomorphism that we've already established. So this is phi of a b inverse. But that must mean that whatever element x y inverse is, it came from some element a b inverse, and a b inverse is an element of k because k is a subgroup, and subgroups have closure. Therefore, x y inverse is equal to phi of some element from k. Therefore, x, y inverse belongs to phi of k. And so phi of k satisfies the one-step subgroup test. So the image of a subgroup, the forward image of a subgroup under a homomorphism, is also a subgroup. So a subgroup of G will map to a subgroup of H using a homomorphism. What about the opposite direction? If we start instead with a subgroup of the target group H, and look at the inverse image. Is the inverse image necessarily going to be a subgroup of G? And the answer to that also turns out to be yes. So let's prove that. Starting with a subgroup L of my target group H, and then constructing the inverse image of L, this is going to be the set of everything from G whose image under phi is inside of L. Is that inverse image a subgroup? Again, using the one-step subgroup test. We'll pick elements x and y that belong to my inverse image and figure out whether x, y inverse must also belong to the set phi inverse of L. Well, what do we know about x and y belonging to the inverse image of L? It means that their images, let's call the images A and B respectively, the images belong to L. So x maps to some element of L, we'll call it A. y maps to some element of L, we'll call it B. And if I then take x times y inverse, x times y inverse is going to be some element of the group G. We don't know for sure whether or not it's an element of this green subset or not. That's exactly what's at issue here. We need to prove that it is, but we don't know that it is up front. But on the other hand, we can say something about what the image of x, y inverse under this homomorphism will have to be. 
because my holomorphism has the homomorphism property, which tells me that phi of xy inverse is equal to phi of x times phi of y quantity inverse. So using the product rule and the fact that homomorphisms send inverses to inverses. But phi of x times phi of y inverse is a times b inverse by construction of a and b. But a and b belong to the set L, and the set L was a subgroup of H. And since subgroups have closure under both products and inverses, a and b belonging to L means that a b inverse must belong to L. So a b inverse belongs to L, and hence the object it came from, x y inverse, belongs to the inverse image of L. And therefore, the inverse image of L satisfies the one-step subgroup test and so the inverse image of L is a subgroup of G. All right, so for the big finish of this video, I also want to show that not only is it true that the inverse image of a subgroup is a subgroup under a homomorphism, but that also the same is true for normal subgroups. So how do homomorphisms connect normal subgroups of G with normal subgroups of H? And the answer here is a little bit subtle. And the reason it's a little bit subtle is that it works one way, but it doesn't work the other way. That normality is only preserved in one direction when we connect subgroups of G with subgroups of H. Let's first look at the inverse direction. If you give me a normal subgroup of H, and I look at the inverse image of that normal subgroup, is that inverse image, we know it's a subgroup now, but is it going to be a normal subgroup of G? Is normality preserved under inverse image? To figure that out, Let's show, or let's try to show, that this inverse image, phi inverse of n, is closed under conjugation from the group G. Remember, that's an equivalent condition for this subgroup being a normal subgroup. So if I pick an x that belongs to the, the set phi inverse of n, and a g that belongs outside, or really anywhere inside of my group G, will g x g inverse belong necessarily to my set? If it does, then since x was arbitrary, we've shown that this subset is a normal subgroup. So where is gx g inverse going to live? We don't know that it lives inside of this set yet. Let's try and argue that it does. So to do that, we got to cross the River Jordan here, uh, go across on our homomorphism phi over into the target group h. So we'll let y be phi of x, we'll let h be phi of g, and we'll let h inverse be phi of g inverse. We know that phi connects those two things again because the inverse of the homomorphism uh, applied to G is uh, the homomorphism applied to the inverse of G, since inverses to inverses. So we'll call Y, H, and H inverse those images. All right, so what do we know about Y and H? Well, we assumed that N was a normal subgroup of H, and therefore N is closed under conjugation by all elements from H. So because N was a normal subgroup, we're going to know for sure that h, y, h inverse, the conjugation of y by h, must belong to n. So normal subgroups, remember, are conjugate closed. So h, y, h inverse belongs to n because n was a normal subgroup and y belonged to n. So that's good news because knowing that h, y, h inverse belongs to n also tells me that anything in its inverse image which of which gx g inverse is one thing in the inverse image of h y h inverse. Anything in its inverse image will belong to the inverse image of n. So gx g inverse belongs to the inverse image of n. And we knew that those two were connected just again because of the homomorphism property. Because if h is phi of g, y is phi of x, and h inverse is phi of g inverse, then the homomorphism property lets me get all those together to conclude that phi of gx g inverse um, uh, phi of gx g inverse belongs to n, and therefore gx g inverse belongs to the inverse image of n. And so the inverse image of n is conjugation closed, so the inverse image of n is a normal subgroup. So we get this really, again, powerful statement that if I pick any normal subgroup of H, the inverse image of that normal subgroup will be not only a subgroup of G, but a normal subgroup of G. So homomorphisms in their inverse images take normal subgroups of the target group to normal subgroups of the domain group. And that can be a powerful way to discover more normal subgroups of G besides just the kernel of this homomorphism. The kernel would be the inverse image of the normal subgroup, which contains only the identity element over here on the right. 
But what about the other way? If I pick a normal subgroup of G, is its forward image under a homomorphism going to be a normal subgroup of H? It would be great if this goes both ways, right? So let's assume that M is a normal subgroup of G, and look at the image consisting of the images of all elements from M inside of H. Is that subgroup going to be a normal subgroup of H? To figure that out, again, we're going to test this conjugate close hypothesis. If I pick a Y inside the image of M, and an H from anywhere inside my target group H, is H, Y, H inverse going to belong to 5M? And so when I try to run the same argument again, we know for sure that y belonging to phi of m means that y is equal to phi of some little m that belongs to the set m, just by definition of image. So that definitely works for sure. What we don't know is we don't know whether or not this h that I've chosen over here in my target group is the image of anything at all from g. Because after all, if, g, if phi is not an isomorphism, we don't know for sure that phi is even going to hit h. We know phi is hitting everything inside of phi of m by construction, but we don't know that it's hitting something else randomly outside of phi of m. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. If phi happens to be onto, we can say for sure that it does, and then we can run the rest of this argument without any difficulty. But if it doesn't, we might not be able to do this. So if we can find a g for which h is equal to phi of g, we can run the same argument that we just did and show that g m g inverse belongs to m, and therefore we have conjugate closure, and so m is a normal subgroup implies that phi of m is a normal subgroup, and so we're all good to go. But the problem is we can only do that if we know that h, the h that we picked to prove conjugate closure, which has to be arbitrary, we don't pick it, the universe does, we need to know that it's hit by some g under this homomorphism. And if that's not the case, then we might not be able to prove this. And not only that, it's more, it's worse than just not able to prove it. We can show that there are examples where it doesn't hold. And that's where I want to wrap this video up. If I take this homomorphism that sends the cyclic group of order 2 into the alternating group on five symbols by taking the 0 in Z2 and sending it to the identity element of A5, and taking the 1 in Z mod 2 and sending it to this product of two disjoint 2 cycles, 1, 2, 4, 5. That's an even permutation of five symbols, so it belongs to A5. Then the entire group Z2 is a normal subgroup of itself. So I have a normal subgroup here. But the image, phi of m, consists of just these two elements of A5, identity permutation and 1, 2, composed of 4, 5. Is that a normal subgroup of A5? Well, let's pick an element outside of that normal subgroup and conjugate phi of m by it. When I do that, I conjugate the identity, 2, 3, 4 times identity times 2, 4, 3. That's going to give me the identity element again. But when I conjugate 1, 2, 4, 5 by 2, 3, 4, I do out that symmetric group arithmetic, and I find out but the result, 1, 3, 2, 5, is not, in fact, an element of phi of m. So phi of m is not closed under conjugation from A5. Therefore, phi of m is not a normal subgroup of A5. So here's an example that illustrates that not only could we not prove that the forward image of a normal subgroup is a normal subgroup, but in fact, in general, it might not be true that the forward image of a normal subgroup is a normal subgroup. Because this purple subgroup was normal over here, but its image, the green subgroup of A5, was not normal over there. Despite the fact that this was, in fact, a homomorphism between these two groups. So this is a pretty good list of the kinds of properties that make working with homomorphisms still a joy. It's not quite the joy of working with isomorphisms where everything between the two groups is exactly the same. But, by contrast, now we get some powerful tools that help us, if I don't understand one of my groups in my homomorphism, I may be able to understand some pieces of it by understanding the homomorphism and understanding the relevant pieces that it connects to on the other side. For example, if I want a subgroup of my target group, I can find one as the image of a subgroup from the domain group. If I want a normal subgroup in the domain, I can find it as the inverse image of a normal subgroup from the target group. So these are some really powerful properties that are still preserved under homomorphisms, so that even though my groups might no longer be the same that are connected by two homomorphisms, a lot of their properties, the properties of their elements, and the properties of their substructures can still be related, and in fact can still be the same as one another under a homomorphism.